All right, welcome everyone to the HCI seminar. So today's speaker is Iyad Rawan from the MIT Media Lab, and I'm very excited that he's talking today about some of these really large-scale experiments um, that he was doing in the last years. And just a short announcement, we have another HCI-related talk today at 4 p.m. from Justin Chang from Stanford, and he's talking about anti-social computing. So if you like this talk, there's another talk at 4 p.m. kind of unrelated. So thank you very much for coming, and I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you all for having me here. I hope you can hear me well. Um, and uh, so I just moved to the Media Lab uh, about a year and a half ago, after spending about 10 years in uh, Dubai. Uh, I was working at uh, an institute there called Mustard Institute, which is um, establishing collaboration with MIT. And I was always, I was in an EECS department, but I always felt like I was a misfit. Um, so I feel a bit more comfortable um, at the Media Lab uh, because I don't only do computer science, more uh, social sciences. Having said that, I'm happy to be close to computer science uh, as well, which is where my background uh, is. Uh, because ultimately I'm interested in uh, kind of social science questions that arise from uh, new computational capabilities. And, and sometimes to answer these questions, all you need to do is just pure social science. In other cases, you need to build things too. Uh, so you need to build platforms so that you can actually test out your theories or your ideas about how technology might change the way we do things. And one of those things is uh, large-scale uh, cooperation. So um, <clears throat> if you think of the, you know, the internet when it first came, uh, it sort of ushered a, a lot of optimism about how it's going to uh, bring down barriers, it's going to destroy hierarchies, and it's going to, to make a lot of old institutions um, kind of irrelevant. You know, because now we can, peer, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, we can build all kinds of um, flash organizations, you know, very quick uh, organizational uh, uh, human organizations that can work together and achieve whatever they want, and it's fr through some kind of mutual, you know, consent. Um, and you don't need uh, bigger hierarchies. And I think that you know, over the last couple of decades, we've learned that this vision is not um, so easy to achieve, and that, and especially, you know, closer to my my part of the world, uh, I come from Syria. Uh, the Arab Spring, for example, was supposed to be something that would be empowered by social media, and um, and it did actually work in getting people to the street, but it wasn't really effective in getting people to organize around building the alternative institutions that would allow them to achieve their goals. And in fact, it became a weapon, you know, in the hands of the adversaries to track people and to mobilize counter sort of. Uh, uh, revolution, if you like, and more recently, ISIS is also using social media. So I think all of these things are kind of, um, they're a new medium, a new tool, a new weapon that can be used by all kinds of parties, and we still don't really understand how they can be used and what their strengths and weaknesses are, and what the control structures that uh, can actually allow us to uh, get their benefits while, while minimizing their risks. What are, what are they? What are the levers we could, we could use? And um, I hope that some of the things that I've worked on, which are much more applied, and much more embedded in the real world, can help um, us think about, as computer scientists, think about um, theoretical and technical solutions uh, as well. But I think it's important to recognize the human dimension and that real world problems are more complex than we might initially think in our simplified models. Um, <clears throat> And towards the end of, the, uh, of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about the new kind of challenge that I think is going to face, we're going to face, which is how to govern artificial intelligence algorithms. And I'm hoping that you know, I, I would also be able to contribute to that, um, again, through the lens of social science. And specifically here in the context of machine ethics for self-driving cars. So, so the talk is broken down into multiple um, stories, and I'm going to go fast because I want to cover multiple things so that we can draw broad lessons from, uh, from all of these challenges. Um, but each one of them has been a, an attempt to not just do things in, a, in the lab or an Amazon Mechanical Turk, but actually to go down to the real world and try and make something happen, you know, or something happen at a large scale. So bear with me on technicalities. I'm going to, they're going to be a little bit thin, 
but there are, I'll put all the papers, uh, the citations of the papers at the end so you can look up more details. And I'm going to start with um, a challenge that took place uh, in 2009. This is where kind of my interest and fascination with these problems of large scale cooperation in socio technical systems started. And <clears throat> this is a, uh, in 2009, there was a challenge to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the internet, so the first IP uh, packet to be sent. And DARPA wanted to organize to commemorate this anniversary through a challenge that would test what is it that we can do as a, as a what kind of human organization is possible today that would be, have been impossible 40 years ago. And they envisioned this challenge by, uh, this, it was Regina Dugan and Peter Lee at the time uh, in DARPA uh, before they moved on to Silicon Valley, and they envisioned, they designed this challenge. The idea that um, can you use social media and the internet to mobilize large crowds of people who can locate 10 weather balloons uh, without, with an unknown location. So all you, knew, all you knew was was that they would be somewhere in the continental United States and that they would be tethered and made available in one month. And you had to, the first team to submit the G GPS coordinates of all 10 balloons um, wins the prize, $40,000 at the time. How many people have heard of the Red Balloon Challenge? Okay, about half. Um, so uh, this challenge was one uh, by a group at the Media Lab. Just a couple of months before I came to visit Sandy Pentland's group, so this is a group run by Sandy Pentland who runs the Human Dynamics group at the Media Lab, and these are his students and postdocs, and they found the red balloons, all of them, in under nine hours, which is impossible in any, using any conventional, uh, you know, unless you have the National Guard, you know, the entire army sort of like combing the streets, right? So what this showed was, was really kind of a victorious moment for the internet, and you know, this is before social media really became a, uh, a big force, you know, widely available. Just by, uh, Twitter was around, but you know, it was not as big as it is today, I think. And, and it's amazing, you know, you can do something like this using social media, you can organize you know, hundreds of thousands of people to search. Um, but of course the question is, well, how, how does it happen? Can, it doesn't just happen. Um, the innovation that the group uh, came up with was using a, a, an incentive scheme that is similar to, um, actually inspired by work from uh, John Kleinberg, uh, Query Incentive Networks. And the idea here is that you would, uh, you would incentivize two things. You would incentivize the reporting of the balloon. So if Dave here finds a balloon and reports it back to the MIT team, the MIT team would, will share $2,000 from the reward with Dave. But it also incentivizes propagation because the person who recruited Dave, namely Carol, gets half of that reward. And the person who recruited Carol, Bob, gets half of the reward and so on. And in this case, in this uh, purely uh, stylized example, Alice is actually able to get a reward through this path as well as this path because two of the people uh, Alice recruited, recruited somebody who recruited somebody who found the reward. And the cool thing here is that um, this thing it operates in a way that is completely opposite to um, a uh, the traditional one, you know, uh, search uh, using uh, reward for finding, you know, any information leading to finding somebody. Because, you know, if you're trying to find Bin Laden and you have a, a you know a million dollars on his head, then you would have to uh, people would. If somebody knew information or, you know, or knew about this challenge, they would not want to share this information with others because they're com competitors. There's nothing for you to gain. Whereas in this incentive scheme, there's something for you to gain. In fact, in expectation, you're extremely unlikely to find the balloon yourself. Um, so you're, um, unless you're, we live in a very strange world, you know, with social networks have very strange properties, um, it's the best uh, strategy to spread the information as wide as possible. And this is why it works. And in fact, uh, <clears throat> there were thousands of, hundreds of thousands of visitor, visitors, uh, people recruiting people in other countries, because ultimately, even if this person can't find a balloon, they can recruit somebody who does, and you can still get paid. Um, so we, uh, so I joined Sandy's group at the time, uh, like just a couple of months after this, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be part of the team that analyzed the data. This is one of the actual uh, trees. 
uh, recruitment tree. So this person recruited somebody and lots of other people, but one of them uh, recruited uh, one of the balloon partners. Um, and we started looking basically initially at the statistical properties of these trees, uh, these cascades. You know, their, their tree depth was, uh, you know, had a long tail, uh, the branching factor had a long tail, things that you would expect in these kinds of systems. Um, and the time that it would take between a person signing up, because what, what people did is, in order for this system to work, um, Alice needed to sign up on the system, create a, um, a personalized URL right, with a random string that Alice can share on social media or email and any other uh, medium. And this URL would allow us to track who recruited, Bo that Alice recruited Bob and this person right? um, to be able to reconstruct the network later. So, <clears throat> so this is the distribution of time between the signing up of Alice and the signing up of the people who were recruited by this. So how long it takes for people to get activated. Um, and it, it also kind of has a, a longer tail, but then it cuts off, right? because eventually it's a time critical challenge that people need to move on fast. Um, one of the reviewers, so this work was published in Science at the time, which was really cool, and uh, one of the reviewers said, well, you know, MIT has a big name, it's well known, maybe that's the only reason, you know, that's, that's, that's the way, that's the reason it works. And we, uh, we presented this figure in, in support of the alternative hypothesis that it was actually the incentive mechanism because this person, George, George Hotz, who was the third ranked team, um, had 50,000 followers at the time. And he was able to mobilize people by creating a lot of retweets and tweets about his team, but that quickly died out because there was nothing in it for the people who were participating. You would just help him make money. Um, he's, a, he's the guy, I think, who hacked the Xbox or something like that. And so he was already famous. Uh, whereas the MIT team had its own little uh, Twitter handle, like a new Twitter handle with very few followers, and was able to, um, you know, geocatchers, I think they used um, uh, pro-social incentives, you know, giving to charity, and it very quickly died out. Um, and <laughs> on the other hand, MIT team, I think, was able to sustain a lot, you know, for a longer period of time, a cascade of recruitment. Um, and one of the interesting things that we found, which is, I think is interesting for computer scientists, is that um, what is the search algorithm used by people? Were they just recruiting people at random? Was it just a random search, random mobilization? And what we found is that um, people were recruiting friends who were further than expected. So people seem to be doing something. We don't know what it is, but maybe they were emailing friends who were in other states. So if you pick, you know, there are models of you know, the distribution, geographical distribution of friendship, and the, uh, those models don't predict where people had recruited their friends from. They were actually further, uh, located further than expected. And, um, and I think that's interesting because it shows how people are able to escape the local sort of clustering of their social networks uh, by explicitly making uh, long-term recruitment efforts. Um, so it seems that you know, the networks are amazing, they can, social networks can, can, can do all sorts of things. And I was very interested in understanding the limits of this capability, so when I went back to uh, Dubai, I started a, uh, I couldn't afford to do uh, more and more uh, DARPA network challenges. Uh, I mean, the UAE is rich, but not that rich. Um, so instead, we, we resorted to simulations, and we used uh, population density and uh, mod various models. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to talk about them in detail, but uh, models of geographical spreading of social networks, models of human mobility, branching dynamics of recruitment, and how long it takes for messages to be, for people to be activated. And uh, basically, you select the seed, let's say at MIT, you wait for, you draw a response time for some distribution, which is you know, uh, the distribution we observe in the data. You recruit a number of uh, people. Some of them are, act are active, so they, they, they might recruit other people. And some of them are just passive, so they just see the message and move on. But if they see the balloon, they will, they will click, right? they, they, so they will report it. So they're not mobilizers, but they are um, actors, uh, only actors. And then you, you choose from a short and large uh, distance uh, friendships, which is again something to do with the distribution of friendships. Um, and you repeat. So, and I'm gonna skip all of these details of these models of you know, uh, friendship and recruitment and so on. 
Uh, but what I'm going to show is, and this is the waiting time distribution, for example, between uh, the recruiter and the recruit. Uh, so basically have the seed, draws this from the distribution, recruited three people. Uh, one of them is a passive recruit, doesn't do anything, but if this person finds a balloon, you're done. Uh, these people are active recruits, so again, each one of them throws a waiting time from the distribution and then activates and recruits another bunch of people and so on. And um, we look, we try to see, well, if you don't have any passive people, this is the first thing that was a little bit striking. In this, in this basic simulation, it's fairly, fairly low-level simulation. Um, if you don't have passive recruits, you're nearly never going to find the balloons. So if you're only relying on people who are mobilizers, and you, you use the parameters that we observe in the data, the people who signed up, who created accounts, so they are active uh, mobilizers, you're never going to find the balloons, even if people move around in very large diameters. They have a large uh, radius of generation. But, so you need a significant number of passive recruits to be able to have to find the balloons with, with reasonable probability. And I think this is for me was, was an interesting first finding that you know, not everybody has to buy into the system. It has to be a, you know, a, a, a gung-ho Wikipedia contributor. Most people contribute very little, but then some people are you know, heroes and you know, champions of the system. And they, play an, a very, they play an important role, but they're not sufficient. You need the low-level contributors, the occasional contributors. And then we started, um, you know, we're playing with the probability, with, with the radius of uh, mobility to see, well, under what conditions you know, you need 400 passive recruitment per person. So you need each person to find, to, to notify 400 other people and for the radius of gyration to be about two kilometers in order to find the balloons within the time frame that we observed. So it's kind of a way of doing kind of theory from a single observation just to see how plausible it was. So we're kind of doing, the whole thing is that we're calculating the p-value of the actual challenge uh, by doing a lot of simulation. Um, and we're also finding things like, uh, we explore things like, what, you know, was there something special about the locations of the balloons that were uh, chosen by DARPA? And it turns out not so much. Um, and we've also incorporated things, uh, the, the difficulty of search in a physical environment as kind of a parameter. So the idea here is that you know, if there's nobody in, in, if there's only one person uh, somewhere, uh, you cannot recruit them. You know, it's, it's very unlikely that you would be able to recruit this person, but once you recruit them, they, they should be able to see the balloon very clearly. But in somewhere like Manhattan, uh, you, you have many more people to recruit, but they're distracted. So if you model this, you end up with a kind of sweet spot, uh, you know, of uh, where it's easier to find objects, because you can mobilize people and they can search easily. Which is, another way of putting it is that if you want to hide from social networks, you should either be in Manhattan or in some little tiny town, right? Which seems to be, a, you know, either hide in plain sight or hide in the middle of nowhere. What do you mean by blendability here? Um, so we, we just kind of chose a function, you know, we, we, we looked at the scaling um, uh, of different phenomena in cities and we, said, we thought blendability is basically something that grows superlinearly, which says that, you know, the probability of you finding something that is there grows superlinearly with the size of the city. You know, with the, sorry, with the population density. So, as population density increases, the the probability that you will not find the balloon that is there grows superlinearly. And then, so if you combine these two, uh, then then you get this good. Uh, and then you can find out things like this. You know, like which 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 because uh, the, the whole uh, census uh, was dividing uh, people into or the entire country into one one kilometer by one kilometer squares, and here you know, you can see which square you have to hide in if you like, to minimize probability of being found. Uh, but another thing that is interesting, now I'd like to talk a little bit about the difficulties that, that arise, you know, so not everything is great. These are the actual balloon locations, and these are all the submissions that the MIT got, the MIT team got uh, during the challenge. So there was actually more noise than, than information, and at the time, they use a whiteboard and just kind of calling people and corroborating, uh, you know, multiple submissions in order to be sure that these locations are actually accurate before they submit them to DARPA. And including some absurd ones, obviously, that were easy to filter, um, which were outside the country. 
Uh, but there's still a lot of noise, and it was kind of uniformly distributed. And there are, we have some anecdotal evidence about where these things came from. And one of them is you know, some of the competing teams who said, you know, let's, let's send up balloons in Cambridge, Belmont, Somerville, just to throw off the other teams um, and, and hack the exit data in, to modify the GPS in case somebody was prudent enough to look at this data. Um, so one of, the issue, one of the ways to overcome this was to, to try and call and say, you know, can you send a picture of yourself with the balloon? And that makes it a little bit harder. Um, um, then a little bit harder to fake, and you know these are actually photoshops, uh, these two. <laughs> so um, you can tell. Another thing is during the challenge, the teams discovered that every uh, balloon was manned by a DARPA official who was wearing a vest like this uh, and a mug, and some teams went to the shops and actually got these uh, these jackets in order to, to provide a plausible uh, false information. Um, and it's kind of fun and games here because it's, a, it's fun in balloons, but I always wonder, you know, what, is, what, what, what can we believe um, when we look at social media? Now we're discussing fake news, you know, but even earlier, a few years ago in Syria, things were happening. I couldn't really know, tell what I was, whether I was, what I was reading in the news, even in the main news, uh, mainstream news media. BBC, CNN were unreliable because information, you know, I would call my mom and, and information would be completely different. Uh, let alone Facebook and, and Twitter. Um, so the second challenge is a similar one, but in this case it was funded by the State Department and the goal was to find individuals. So the question was, suppose these individuals are thieves and you have only a mugshot of the person, can you find a person who's mobile, moving around in a city, in a remote city, um, within a reasonable amount of time? So they had these, um, you had to find the suspect, these suspects were paid actors, um, you saw only a mugshot of them in the morning. You, you had to take photographs of them, upload the images to it. And uh, this is a picture of, that was released of the suspect, quote unquote, in Bratislava, in Slovakia, at 8 a.m. And this is the, using the same techniques, I, we found this person by 11 a.m. Um, this is my phone in Dubai uh, with a picture of this person, a second picture of this person, found by one of the volunteers. And again, it's using the same kind of incentive scheme website and personalized links that people can share and so on. Uh, which is kind of remarkable because these people, this is a harder challenge. You knew the city, so it was not an entire continent, but you, it was a person, he was, this person was on the move. And out of uh, five people in five different cities, we found three of them. So it would have been really nice if we found them, uh, so they were all available around for about 12 hours. It would have been really nice if the average you know, now it says 12 hours of separation would have been, six hours of separation would have been much nicer. Um, but uh, I'll take that. And this was actually, um, uh, yeah, we couldn't, no, no other team was able to find three. They were only able to find, a couple of teams found one each, uh, one person each. So now, what can we learn from this? Again, it's, it's a single event. Right? It's, a simple, it's a single attempt at uh, a very difficult thing that was believed to be impossible before. So. Uh, one of the things we found, we, we learned, is that the, uh, this lady here, who was found in a coffee shop in Washington, D.C., was found by David Allen Greer, the president of the IEEE Computer Society. Uh, and not only that, he's also a fan of crowdsourcing. He wrote the book, When Computers Were Human, about you know, prehistoric mechanical Turk, um, when, when, when there were no computers and there were humans doing all of the computation. And I think that's really interesting, not just because it's absurd, but also because David Allen Greer was, um, was somebody who was interested in the challenge. So he was, some, he was one of the people who had affinity with these sort of questions. So he was more likely. And I think he heard about it through the crowd pool mailing list, by the way. Just to, <laughs> um, that's what, if I remember correctly. Um, so he could tell by the tweets that most of the crowd were looking in the grand public places and he made a, an explicit decision to go, you know, to, so he wondered where a woman in her mid twenties might spend the day. He went to a coffee shop, and that's where he found her. So I think that's really cool because he had both affinity with the task as well as local knowledge that he was able to exploit to be useful. And it's something maybe we can learn uh, about from more broadly. Um, so again, when we when we looked at the data, we noticed, you know, again we're trying to now we have very little data, but we try to reconstruct what may have happened because we want to come up with plausible models. How likely is this? What's the p-value of what we observe, right? Um, if, if search was being kind of random. 
Um, and one of the interesting things we found is that um, the average distance of people who visited the website, it kind of oscillated a little bit, but, we, but it converged, um, it, it got lower and lower. So this is the average distance from a person who's visiting our site to the closest city, if you, if you geolocate the IP address. So the, the, the crowd is somehow converging towards those cities. And we tried to understand, well, how did they do this? So we started looking at the, the, the tweets, the total number of tweets about our team. And the proportion of those tweets that was targeted at a specific person. So they were not just, hi guys, help me find this person. You know, here's my, link, my personalized link. It was at Stephanie, can you help me find this person. So this suggests that you know, whoever is posting this information is, has tacit knowledge about what, where Stephanie lives or where she might be traveling and so on. And this information was use, used in this case. It was very hard for us. It's not Googleable information, but it's information that was used in the search process. Um, so you can see here that towards the end, the majority of tweets were actually targeted at specific individuals. And the second thing is that out of these targeted uh, uh, out of these, what is the proportion of them that was targeted at a person who is in one of those five cities? And again, it goes almost to 90%. Okay. So two thirds of the tweets were to people in, uh, were targeted at specific people, and of those, 90% were targeted at people. And this is for the subset that we can actually geolocate using their further uh, account information. Um, so this allows us to start doing simulations to say, well, what is the chance, you know, how, how, what is the search algorithm on the, so on the global social network, what is the um, diffusion algorithm that allowed us to find these people? And we're gonna skip through this, but basically what we, what we did is we took, um, you know, you, you can have a broad kind of random search, so you just invite everybody, you just post the information at random, or you can greedily try to target specific people, right? Who you believe live closer to one of those cities. And you can, you can say with, with some probability, I'm going to uh, do a greedy search, and with some probability, one minus that, I'm going to just randomly uh, choose a friend to, to mobilize. And it turns out that you know, you, to, to obtain basically the, uh, the proportion that we observe, you need one in three tweets to be targeted. And so, so this, is, this is what would happen by the way, we, this is what would happen in a purely kind of random walk on the global social network, and this is what would happen in order for us to observe what we saw in Twitter. And by the way, what we used a, the global uh, airline network as an approximation of the uh, global social network, which, because um, Barry Wellman, who's a sociologist at Toronto, showed that these are highly popular. Um, so that's another project where you see this kind of specific challenge, kind of a, you, know, you make it happen, and then you spend time trying to reconstruct the pieces from the information you have to have a plausible explanation for why it worked and under what conditions would it continue to work. Um, okay, so now we'll talk about the third challenge, but before that, there were things that went wrong as well. So one case, um, in Sweden, we never found this guy, but uh, at some point, there was a misguided search on for this other guy on, on Facebook. So we, we heard reports that people called his house. I mean, people managed to get this person's phone number and called his family and ask him, you know, ask them, where is your, you know, do you know where your son is by any chance? Um, and I mean, the resemblance is not super strong, but you know, there is some resemblance. And of course, in this case, it was again, it was benign. But in some other cases, for example, in the Boston Marathon bombing, this person was misidentified. Uh, to the grief of his parents, only to be discovered um, later that he was he had drowned um, uh, two weeks earlier. Uh, but for some period of time, you know, parents must have believed that maybe their son was a terrorist, but it must have been extremely distressing. Um, so again, fake news. Um, third challenge now I want to talk about is um, the shredder challenge which is now a different problem. So, so the first two challenges were about, you know, can social network cover a very large geographical area by disproportionately recruit, first of all, by recruiting people successfully, and second, by disproportionately recruiting people further than expected, right? So, to, to, so as to not be stuck inside the highly clustered social networks. 
Yes, they can. And then if you, if you knew where your target is, which is a specific city, social networks are also able to greedily search you know, to, in a way that allows them to converge to those cities with higher probability. Now we have a combinatorial challenge. So this one is a DARPA challenge. And it was uh, based on, I don't know if it was inspired by the movie Argo, but it, was, it has resemblance to that. Uh, essentially, they sh shredded documents using actual shredders. And then they scanned every piece and put it online and said, first thing to assemble all five of them and solves the riddles in them wins $50,000. In this case, so these are the five puzzles. And they were of increasing complexity because the, they, they use more, more, a more and more powerful shred. So these had tiny, tiny shreds. And we'd hate to have the, the job of uh, having to actually scan all those pieces. Um, so most teams in this case used uh, image processing techniques. And the idea was that you, if you could match the grains, I know nothing about this, by the way. If you could match the grain on the, uh, on the pieces of uh, the shreds of paper, and um, do some kind of alignment, maybe a sequence alignment of some sort on the pixels, then you could solve this. But obviously, it's a, it's a combinatorial problem because you can rotate every piece and there's all sorts of combinations. Right? Um, and of course, being a bad computer scientist, uh, we went for the crowdsourcing approach as usual. Uh, so, together with collaborators at UC San Diego, we designed uh, this a crowdsourcing platform that allows hundreds of people to simultaneously assemble these things. And you know, over time, new features were added, you can rotate things, you could lock pieces and move them together, and so on. And it, it kind of worked. You know, this is the second puzzle uh, after being assembled. And out of the five puzzles, uh, the team was able to solve three, um, only to, uh, to find a surprise at some point. But what I, what, I, what I wanted to show first is that this approach was actually quite successful. So um, if there are errors which you could classify as you know, two pieces that were placed together, which shouldn't be together, or two pieces that were, were together and were removed incorrectly, uh, most of those errors were recovered in a couple of minutes, and 94% of them in, under, in less than an hour. So the, the crowd seemed to be efficient at putting things together and at fixing its own mistakes. Um, and then also, another interesting thing we saw, which is sort of similar to what you would see in most crowdsourcing systems, is that um, there's a big inequality. So this is the Lorenz curve, where you know, uh, the red line depicts um, com you know, equal cumulative contribution by every user. And this line is the actual sort, you know, contributions of users sorted by their magnitude of contribution. So the bigger this, this area between those two curves, the more inequality there is between in the contributions of different people. And what you find here is that not only is there high inequality, so few people do all, most of the work, most people do very little, you know, they just move a few pieces around, but as the challenge gets harder, this inequality increases. So for puzzle four, the, the Gini coefficient was, was much higher. And I think this is probably a phenomenon of crowdsourcing systems in general. You know, the, more, the higher the bar is for making a, a significant contribution, the more it matters the more contribution there that the, the die hard workers actually contribute. I, I'm interested to know if there are I've observed this in other domains. So now let's talk about what happened in puzzle four. Because everything was going great and you know crowdsourcing was going to win the third challenge and, and prove itself in both search and you know real world search and combinatorial search. Uh, but then this happened. This is the community progress and this is the massive um, uh, Kind of failure that took place, and um, it's because of this guy who emailed Manuel Sebrian, who was the uh, the guy leading the team in, in San Diego, and talked about. And the email was UCSD saboteur at hushmail.com. This person sent an email and described it, so kind of in a very you know Hollywood villain type of uh, approach. You know that they don't just do things; they they stop and try to explain to you what they did. Um, and they said, you know, the first attack was moving the pieces to a single pile, but then you quickly, you know, locked the pieces and banned my IP address. But then, um, it seems the second attack, I used a VPN of the neighbor's wireless and some new IP address to get some new IP addresses and then selected the pieces and placed them on top of each other. This got old soon and so on. 
And then a more sneaky attack where you would you know, move different pieces so that you don't notice that I'm actually doing the attack. This was all during the email. Uh, this is during the challenge, which then cost the team the victory. I mean, eventually, one of the other teams won. Unfortunately, we never managed to solve puzzle four. Um, we did spend over a year afterwards trying to understand what happened and basically do computer forensics combined with data science and because we had a, a log of every single move made by every single user. Um, and this is this is puzzle two. These are all the pieces moving around in puzzle two from the beginning to end. And you see that it's kind of nice, it's neat, pieces kind of converge into the square in the middle. And now I'm going to show you puzzle four where again here we're speeding them up. I think mostly um, uh, 30 frames per second or 100 frames per second. Yeah, this is 30 frames per second. And you can see there's some kind of organization of the space. There seems to be some sort of division of labor, uh, I think. And we tried to, even just classifying what moves are actually attack moves took a while, you know, because so these, these we think are attack moves. And, and um, uh, what we call automatic moves is basically going to be recovery from the locks, which happens later. But you'll see the, uh, the attack was slowing things down. So there's another attack, one frame per second, uh, another attack. And you'll see now the final attack that kind of blew everything up at the end, uh, which will appear any moment now. There we are. And you can see that trying to reconstruct things is extremely difficult, because attack destruction is much quicker than construction. And now we have we have recovery from uh, from the logs, but and this is a so by the way the, the attacker claimed that he actually went to 4chan and recruited a crowd of attackers as well. I think this, this didn't really last for long, but but I think this is what it is the, the one you just saw, like a distributed attack from kind of a DDoS, but you know on on actual combinations. So later on, if you're interested, there was uh, yeah. So this is kind of the the. These are additional uh, bits of the message sent by the, uh, uh, the attacker. But basically, the attacker saw this approach as illegitimate. And the way you know, that crowdsourcing is basically cheating, uh, and crowdsourcing is actually an ugly plan of attack, even if it is effective, um, which I guess remains to be seen here. Uh, and I think this, I like to see this, this, this statement as a kind of uh, uh, the opposite of our fears of machines. You know, this person saw so this, uh, this challenge as a challenge for machines uh, to solve, but uh, the humans were taking their jobs, and this was not acceptable. Um, so, but if you're interested in kind of more uh, detailed kind of discussion of the motives behind this, you could read an article that was written by a, uh, a tech journalist in Back Channel, where you know he contacted us and, and asked us to. You know, did you know who the attacker was? And we actually did. We, we actually managed to triangulate the attacker's identity through the first login and the IP address happens to be used with, on another machine, you know, uh, on the same machine but with a different login. So we were able to, to triangulate the person and we connected the two and uh, he interviewed, the journalist interviewed the attacker who was from one of the teams, not the winning team. And he called him Adam for anonymity. Um, and Adam says, I don't remember, you know, think, dramatic things like, you know, I don't remember the, mo the point at which I made the conscious decision. I guess it was a spur of the moment kind of thing. So, uh, and, and he was kind of more nice this time. He said, you know, maybe, maybe this would help people who build crowdsourcing systems to uh, build them to be more resilient, more uh, to, to these kinds of attacks. So maybe I did something good in there. Um, it helps them sleep, sleep at night, that's fine. Um, so, in our analysis, we started trying to see basically what is the signature of, of the attack. You know, what happens before and after the attack, and, and does it have only an immediate effect on the performance of the crowd or a long-term effect? And uh, we find a couple of clues, and one of the clues is, uh, you know, this is the efficiency of the user. So each dot here is a user, and this is how much time a user takes to make a certain number of moves. And you see that you know, people spend more time in the system, they make more moves. And, and then in puzzle four, before the attack, you can see that this slope actually goes slightly up, upwards. So people become faster, more efficient, assuming that they're still doing 
making incorrect moves. Um, but what happens is that during the attack, first of all, you see these red dots who are, we believe are attackers. They make many, many moves faster. But they also, the responders start moving fast because they're trying to, to they're scrambling to correct it, you know, undo the, the damage. And what we find also afterwards is that the, the attack has slowed things down afterwards. And I think it's because people are now s distributing their mental energy between construction and verification of the work of others. That, okay, nothing fishy is happening. And I think that's really interesting. And maybe there are kind of universal trade-offs that we have to deal with. Uh, for any open system, you know, this is my hypothesis, that for any open system that is unregulated, that does not have a, a purely, um, well, let's say, as the ability to open the system grows, uh, goes up, so the regula regulability of the system goes up, then the trade-off between, um, then the, the performance will go down because of self-policing. So there's, you either outsource the policing to an entity, separate entity, so you can get on with your job, or you have to do it yourself, and, and, and basically it's a, maybe it's a zero sum, right? In the end, you don't really gain. There's a no free lunch theorem you know, version of this, I think. Um, that trades off uh, verification and you know, slash resilience and performance. By the way, please uh, interrupt me anytime if you have any questions or if I've said something silly. I'm just curious, so you mentioned that a lot of the tasks were, like most of the people did a very few tasks, right? Very few movements. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned that all, sort of most of the other teams used computer vision, computer analysis. Uh, can, can you see a combination of the uh, Like the crowdsourcing and like yeah, can some of these like very small movements be made by, or at least validated by, by an algorithm? I think so, yeah. I think it's the story of automation, right? You, once you routinize something, you can start you know, uh, automating part of it, and, and humans have to switch to something else, which is what's happening in the economy now. Uh, did, did any of the teams do that? I don't think so, no. I think they were, some of them were doing kind of manual, you know, they were checking themselves, the result of their own algorithms, that's what we read. Uh, but it wasn't done in, a, you know, in an open way, like a kind of crowdsourced approach. Um, can we use the crowd to find it? Yeah, but then, but then, yeah, again, it's the same thing, right? It's a trade-off. You have maybe some, you, you designate some as policemen, right, who are, uh, check the moves of somebody else, maybe at random, um, yeah. But then, yeah, in this case, we didn't. We had to, we had to spend time, actually, looking through the logs. And, and the other thing is, is also the, uh, any other questions about this? Sorry, well, why people participate in the challenge? For money, right? Because in, in oh, this, in, so in this case, they were paid in proportion to the, the number of successful contributions they made, um, and also the number of people re they recruited. So we tried to combine them. How do you think that the challenge for your team would have been affected in today's world of fake news, where the other teams are more likely to think of trying to feed you false information? Yeah, I think I think we, we, this is inescapable. I think in here I, I can't see how it would have played out, uh, you know, because information was more, you know, it was a complete information game. Everybody saw the board and all the moves happening. Maybe they couldn't respond quickly enough, but it was um, there was no misinformation. But I can imagine now it's even harder, you know, when you have actors who are feeding misinformation, and especially when the decisions based on misinformation have a very uh, immediate effect. You know, they. When, once you, if you find out the truth, if you find it too late, it doesn't really help. You know, it's like, it's, it's what happened in Syria. For example, you know, eventually we knew that this video was false, but you know, there were already 100,000 people on the street and 10 of them got shot, right? So, so it doesn't really help you to, to, to eventually do some uh, investigative journalism and identify that this was a false, false video from Iraq from five years ago, right? So unless you can find this information in time to prevent the acting on the false information, I don't think you can, so, so I think that's a new kind of problem as well. Uh, I, I don't know if there are game theoretic models of this. It'd be super interesting to, to look at. Um, so let's get through this quickly, and I'll move to the more recent stuff. So, so in the past, I was, I guess, looking at how uh, humans can cooperate uh, uh, by using, using social media as a, as a medium for cooperation, or a medium for kind of combinatorial problem solving uh, at the same time, which is what happened in the the challenge, but um, 
since I moved here, I've been fascinated by, you know, this fear of AI and you know autonomous cars and how we're going to regulate everything and and so on. And being a person who's got a foot in social sciences and a foot in computer science, I thought maybe maybe we can I can help explore this, you know, and, and kind of uh, bring some of the social science methods to bear on this question. Um, so we started some, some work on, which eventually led to kind of a crowdsourcing effort that I will talk about in a minute. Uh, but essentially the premise is self-driving cars are great, they're going to save a lot of lives. I'm personally terrified of uh, the fact that humans drive cars. I think it's a, bad, it's a bad idea. I think it's unfortunate and it's hopefully it's only temporary because we know that we're not reliable. We know that we get tired. We, you know, some of us drink and don't follow the law and so on. And they keep, you know, it's, it's a major source Major, score, major cause of death in our society. Um, if you think of it, it's insane. You know, it's like one ton pieces of metal on wheels moving at high speeds in an urban environment. It doesn't sound like it's something that that should be that should lead to good outcomes. You know, uh, in the long run. And indeed, it doesn't. You know, there are uh, thirty thousand deaths in the U.S. alone per year, and in, uh, and globally, one point two uh, million traffic fatalities. It's insane. Um, you know, if, if, a, if a epidemic killed 1.2 million people, then the whole world would mobilize. We kind of got used to this. Um, so a lot of smart people are working on this. I'm sure some of them are here um, at CSAIL. Um, but people are afraid of this. And people are afraid because they keep thinking about this problem, the trolley frigging problem, um, which, is, um, which doesn't go away. You know, well, what will happen if the car will crash into a number of people, but can crash into somebody else, in, and you know, kill one person to save the ten or the five? Should the car do so? Who should decide? Uh, what should happen in this case? And I think this is a legitimate question because we're not really used to the idea. You know, we got used to one insane idea, which is humans driving one ton pieces of metal in urban environments, but we didn't get used to the idea of a robot doing it, um, especially when. Uh, the technology is not 100% reliable, and people do die from car accidents. And I think, and what makes it even more um, uh, difficult to think about is the fact that maybe the the harm minimizing action involves the sacrifice of the person who owns the car, the person who's sitting in the car by crashing into a wall. So these are new kinds of challenges. We can argue for hours about you know this is not really realistic in the real world you know the cars use light lasers and other things you know and that, that there is a continuum of actions and, and a gradation of risk and so on but I think the bottom line still remains that in the end whether you're choosing between value you know lives lost or expected lives lost it's the same kind of thing you know we we that's how we model the world you know expected life lost is the same as an actual life loss because that's what will happen. You know, over large numbers. So for every hundred thousand accidents, how many pedestrians may kill versus how many passengers? That's the same kind of problem. Um, and people are worried about this problem. And even if the cars are safer for everybody, even if the cars are going to eliminate 90% of accidents, if people are not comfortable with the system, we may still not have that system. We may we may lose out on this opportunity because people might say, I don't know who to blame in those 10%. And I, or I'm not comfortable. I don't think it's fair. So I think we need to listen. We need to understand what the public is concerned about. And this is where psychological research, I think, can be helpful. So we started this type of work. And initially we thought, well, what, do people think about cars making those decisions differently from humans thinking about these decisions? Uh, what we discovered was a very different, was a much more interesting thing, which was staring everybody in the face that we didn't really see, which is that the the conflict between the incentive of the individual as a citizen and as a, an adopter. So everybody says, basically this is our paper in a nutshell which appeared in Science last year. I would never buy a self-sacrificing car, but I want everybody else to do so. So, and this is, I think, so basically the problem is not a problem of an ethical question of what you know, your car should do in situation X. It's the cooperation problem of how do we decide What's the more important thing here? And how do we avoid the moral hazard of people thinking about their own interests when they buy these cars, not, and ending up with an outcome that doesn't minimize harm for society? So it's kind of like the tragedy of commons, if you're familiar with it. But basically, people acknowledge that the, uh, the morality of sacrifice to save others. So when we ask people, what is the moral thing to do? Most people say, you know, uh, 
sacrifice, you know, this is the moral thing to do is to self is to sacrifice even if it's the, the driver. But when you say, well, would you support legal enforcement of self sacrifice? They say, no, no one has support legal enforcement. And when you ask them, you know, is it moral with you alone or with the family or with, with your own child? Most people would say, you know, uh, it's moral, but I will not purchase it if it's regulated to follow what I think is moral. Yeah, I think this is the right thing to do, but I would never buy a car that does that, and I would be much more likely to buy a car if it doesn't do that, okay? If it puts my own safety first. So I think basically without regulation of some sort, uh, we're going to have a problem here. Um, so, and also it's becoming kind of a, an issue, um, and I think there's a version to regulation at the moment, especially in the US, which is what this sample is. Now, um, car makers have also tried to be uh, quiet about the issue because, you know, that's a rare situation, it's never going to happen, these cars are going to be safer overall, so that's, that's the best, you know, that's what we should focus on, and I agree. But the moment, you know, but people are keep asking them these, these questions, what will the car do, what will the car do? And the moment they open their mouth, uh, somebody from you know, the Mercedes manager of driverless car safety said, if you know you can save the one in the car, save the one in the car, right? So if you, and I think, I think this, he was caught off guard a little bit, you know, he's saying basically that if you are certain that, you know, of a behavior that will save the person in the car, that should be prioritized. But immediately, global tabloids started saying, Mercedes-Benz wants to kill children to save wealthy people in the car, which is not good for public relations, so I think, even if we think that the cars will make everybody safer, um, the fact that it's so visceral and it's so emotionally available to us, you know, means that people are going to keep asking questions until they get satisfactory answer to this question. And at Mercedes, of course, withdrew the statement and said we will do what is legal and what is socially acceptable. And my point is that we don't know what that is. We don't have any quantitative evidence of what is socially acceptable because we don't run surveys. This is what something that we, we try to change. Um, <clears throat> some car makers have been more uh, positive about this. So Bill Ford, who uh, I met here and, and presented the work to, has been very positive about it and said, yes, we do need to uh, discuss the legal issues and we need to come up to a societal sort of agreement, right? social contract of some sort. And he's been outspoken about this in public as well, which is nice. Um, and Obama as well recently discussed this with Joey Ito, um, in, in the recent article in Wired Magazine, which is also a good sign. So, um, and finally, this, this is kind of making its way to, to regulations, or let's say, they're not really regulations at this point, they're called guidelines from the Department of, Tra Department of Transport that says you need to, to think about ethical considerations and you, you need to document this. So we're not going to mandate exactly how to do it. We're not going to say your car has to be utilitarian or has to protect the drivers or has, you know, one child's life is worth two adults or anything like that. But what they want to do is, is they, they want car makers to document, to think about this and to document this thinking so that the Department of Transport itself, the regulators, can also learn from this experience about what the cars can do um, and, and what, what the possible options are. So we wanted to broaden the discussion a little bit by both by involving more people into, in it uh, and also collecting more data. And the data collection, I think, was not really I didn't expect it to be uh, as, as good, as, as, as uh, comprehensive as it turned out to be. So that was, that was a very pleasant surprise. So we created a website called The Moral Machine. Um, <clears throat> and the website generates random dilemmas. So in this case, it's not just the numbers of people being traded off, but also their ages, sometimes their children, sometimes they're male, female, sometimes they're dogs, sometimes, and sometimes they're crossing a red line, so they're breaking the law, which I think has an interesting component. Like, does the law matter? And, uh, and you know, sometimes you're trading off people in the car versus pedestrians, and sometimes it's two groups of pedestrians, uh, which I think is a bit different. And then also, you know, this is the, the, this is the action of omission, this is a commission, you know? This, is, this involves swerving, so we randomize that too. So basically, we randomize a bunch of things. We show people summaries of their results. <laughs> this is a, a former postdoc who, who has a cat, who loves, you know, who's happy to save cats. Um, and we show people how they compare um, on different uh, uh, different dimensions to other people. 
at, you know, for example, you versus others on you know, how much do you value saving more lives, or how much do you value protecting the passengers, or upholding the law, and so on. Um, and we also have a kind of designer, a design mode where you can go and make up your own uh, scenario, and people have been using this in classrooms, which is really nice, and, and, and to, to promote discussion. Um, so these are the, the dimensions you know, that we use, like gender preferences, species preferences, social values, like does a doctor deserve more? Uh, you know, if you knew what, you know, that somebody is a doctor, suppose you did, should that get into uh, consideration or not? Um, and again, we're randomizing you know, whether there's an intervention and so on. And so far, we've, we've, uh, it was reasonable, reasonable uh, success for this. So we translated it to 10 languages. So now it's available in the world's 10 most used languages. 